Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. And thanks to our hosts, Maria Shriver and Lauren Miller for their wonderful introductions and uh, for creating HFC and women's Alzheimer's uh, movement. Obviously, uh, brain health is top of mind, no pun intended, for many people these days. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to join uh, Dr. Annie Fenn and Dr. Aisha Shirzai, who are here live with us right now. And uh, we'll be, we've had a robust conversation about foods that are delicious and brain healthy. So I hope we continue. We were just talking about uh, wild forged morel and mayatake mushrooms, two of my <laughs> favorites. Uh, and apparently you guys have these in your backyard. I'm a little jealous because living <laughs> in New York City certainly has its perks, but we don't have morels in our backyards. How are you guys doing? Good. Very well. Wonderful. Thanks for having yeah. me. This is Thank so you so fun, much for yeah. having me, Rocco. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Um, I, I know that you're in Wyoming and California, where there's an abundance of fresh, local, wonderful ingredients. Uh, before I start taking questions, I just love to know as a chef who's collaborated with many, many uh, doctors and functional medicine physicians and uh, health experts over the years, or over the course of writing 10 plus books on the subject, uh, what are three foods that people should add to their diets today at the end of this session to improve brain health? So, uh, so I, I guess I'll take the I'll take yeah, the question. Dr. Uh, yeah, take yeah, that. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so, you know, as as a physician and as a researcher, someone who actually sees patients in the clinic and in the hospital, um, and I, I treat Alzheimer's disease, and I also do research in the community. It's very important for us, and we were talking about this earlier, that we focus on very easy things that people can do every single day. So, whether it's in uh, in the clinic or in the research, you know, we highlight foods that are very important for the brain. Um, the, you know, I personally try to shy away from the concept of superfood. You know, we don't eat one food at a time, we eat different types of food, but then certain foods stand out. You know, things like green leafy vegetables, they're superb foods. And there've been research that showed that when people actually eat green leafy vegetables on a regular basis, they have younger looking brains and their function of the brain is better too. Things like blueberries or any berries for that matter, spices, pound for pound, they have more anti-inflammatory and antioxidant foods for the brain. We have a concept called the neuro nine, the nine foods to eat. So green leafy vegetables, berries, uh, whole grains like oats and quinoa, which is a pseudo grain, see, uh, seeds like flax seeds, chia seeds, nuts like walnuts and hazelnuts, uh, berries, tea, uh, cruciferous vegetables like Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli. If people add these to their foods every day, uh, not necessarily all of them, but if they can highlight some of the foods on a regular basis, their brain will actually function better. They're going to be able to prevent cognitive decline, not just Alzheimer's disease, but cognitive decline, which is a state where, you know, we start having cognitive decline in our 20s and 30s. So every step of change, every time we eat better foods, we actually prevent that from happening and we live a long, cognitively vibrant life. Yes, I asked I, for I three. Totally you agree. gave me a doctor. I just wanted to add that Dr. Shusai is a neurologist and the co-director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Program at uh, Yoma Linda University, where she leads the lifestyle program for the prevention of neurological diseases. And uh, Dr. Annie Fenn, also a physician chef and culinary instructor, focused on cultivating lifelong brain health with evidence-based food and lifestyle interventions. She's about to publish her first book. I'm, I think I sh should have kept that a secret. I won't, I won't <laughs> tell anyone that I may have heard the name by accident, uh, but thank you both for joining us. Sorry, I forgot to introduce you earlier. No uh, Dr. Fenn, what say you about the subject? Yeah. That's okay. Um, I agree. Aisha and I are both physicians. Um, we're both very science-based when it comes to nutrition. When I was coming up in residency in medical school, nutrition wasn't such a hard science as it has become. And honestly, when I was practicing obstetrics and gynecology for over 20 years, um, we knew a lot about how to prevent heart disease with food, but we didn't know so much how to prevent brain problems with food, like age-related cognitive decline and Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. But since around you know, 2000, 2015, um, there's been this huge mountain of data that shows us that what you eat really does either slow down the aging of your brain or accelerate it. And so in 2015, I decided to focus on this exclusively to teach people how to eat better and to cook with neuroprotective foods. 
so that's why I started the Brain Health Kitchen Cooking School. Um, so I've been doing that since 2015. And since then, the data has grown even stronger. And what we're realizing is that the more the closer you are to a plant-based diet, the more likely you are to age well with a thriving brain, a better memory, and you also have better brain function now. So what Aisha was talking about with the leafy greens, the berries, the cruciferous vegetables, the nuts and seeds, all of those things are super important. They should be the foundation of your diet. And the thing I usually recommend for people to do first is to attack the snack cupboard in their home. <laughs> like I'm a huge believer in the yes. environment. Let's, let's talk about that, yeah. Yeah, because the food environment the intervention in your, home, time in your some car, people. in your office is basically what you end up eating because you know, if you want to eat brain healthy, you have to make the brain healthy choice the easy choice. And your journey for brain health is going to start in your kitchen, really, because you are going to want to cook some of your own food and not rely on outside sources for it. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, first thing to do, my snack cupboard is right here. It used to be, when my kids were little, it was full of all sorts of stuff I don't even want to talk about, like chips and crackers and you know packaged sweets and things like that. You get rid of all of the packaged goods, the processed foods, the foods with refined sugar, the foods with refined carbohydrates, like all-purpose white flour, the things with any ingredients that sound like chemicals or that you can't pronounce. Get rid of all of those foods and replace it with nuts and pumpkin seeds and dates and figs and dark chocolate. And you know you can take a date and open it up and fill it with almond butter. And you've got a nutritious snack that's full of fiber, it's more delicious than anything you can get from a box or a bag. So I would say first approach is your snack cupboard. Absolutely. Yeah. So not only adding these foods, the nine foods that Dr. Shazai mentioned, but getting rid of some of these foods. And uh, I had a hard break with these foods about 15 years ago. Uh, it also, uh, I coupled it with tri triathlons and Ironman. So it was easy for me to do at the time. Not that there's anything easy about Ironman, but when you're when you're training for something that intense, you need every advantage that you can give yourself. And the same thing is true for life, right? When we're training to become older and stay healthy, it's sort of like training for a marathon or a triathlon. You know, this is a, this is a uh, long race. We need to stay healthy for the long term. And breaking up with sugar and all the snack foods that contain the chemicals and the unpronounceable uh, foods that we, sh we should avoid it's hard, but it's only hard for about a month, I've found. What, what do you guys, uh, as physicians who recommend this to your patients every day, what have you found in the research about the time it takes to break up with these or end these toxic relationships with food and people sometimes, but let's just focus on food for now. Yeah, it's, it's so important. Dr. To create, Shuzai, yeah. It's so important to create healthy habits. You're absolutely right, Rocco. I think um, and you know, we were talking about this earlier, as far as information of what kind of foods or dietary patterns are important for brain health, I think we have enough information, you know, having seen wonderful data come from Columbia University, as far as Mediterranean dietary pattern is concerned, or the mind diet, which comes from Rush University, or the, um, you know, the dietary information that comes from other uh, populations, whether it's the California teacher study, Northern Manhattan study in Columbia, where I trained, there is it's essentially a variation of the same theme, more plant-based, less processed and less saturated fats. That's basically, if I had to summarize the information about uh, brain health, foods are concerned, that's basically it. And focusing on creating good habits should be the first step. You can't get to that optimal uh, position or that point all of a sudden. We always say, you didn't get here overnight, you're not gonna get out of it overnight. And understanding your palate, your taste pattern is so important. When I was training as a fellow at Columbia University, I realized that I was giving people more recipes during my en encounter with them than aspirin or a cholesterol medication because it's about long term health. So, you know, having been through cooking school and having worked with people in the behavioral neurology side of things, it's identifying your good points and strengths and identifying your weaknesses. So say, for example, a lot of people have a sweet tooth. They like to have a little bit of candy, some dessert, you know, sugary dessert at the end of the day. How do we create a program where they don't, where they're not drawn to it? So it's not about deprivation. It's not about saying, oh, I'm not going to ever eat that anymore. It's about replacing it with something else. So for example, if people love their candy bars, 
replacing them with beautiful truffles that they can make with dates, walnuts, and cocoa powder, for example, or making beautiful recipes out of cashews with berries and nuts and seeds, instead of saying, I'm not going to have any dessert anymore. So it's all about replacement instead of depriving yourself. Food should never be about depriving yourself. Health should never be about depriving yourself. And food is more than just food. It's who we are. It's our memories. It's our culture. It's our stories and traditions. And to celebrate it in a healthy way, that's what we're all trying to do. And that's what Annie's trying to do too. And I agree. And I also am someone who has, was I, I feel like I was born with a sweet tooth and I blame it on my Sicilian relatives. But honestly, a lot of people have a sweet tooth and that's not really an excuse for me to just eat <laughs> sugar all the time. So somewhere around the age of, I don't know, 35, I decided that I couldn't do that anymore. It wasn't healthy. The data was starting to build that all the sugar is really bad for our bodies and our brains. And so, you know, one of the things that I did that worked for me is I would never buy a packaged sweet, like a packaged cookie or a packaged cake. Um, those things are full of the types of foods that we don't want you guys to eat. Yeah. Um, so if I want to make something that's a treat, I make it myself in my own kitchen and I make sure that I'm using natural sugars, which is sort of a euphemism, but what I mean is like whole food forms of sugar, like honey or dates, things like that. And also lots of fiber. If you have a treat that's full of fiber, it's mm -hmm. going to slow down the absorption of the sugar. Mm -hmm. And there's direct correlation between how your blood sugar spikes and over time, how much time your insulin spikes and the metabolism of your brain and how it ages. So we wanna keep you with a fiber rich diet. Fiber is totally your friend when it comes to these foods. You don't have to give up desserts at all. Um, you just have to make sure that you're choosing the right ingredients. And my rule is I cook them at home. Yeah. Or Aisha has some great- Doctors, you've, you've, <laughs> you've, covered, you've covered so many topics that I talk about every day with my clients and in my books. Uh, let, let's bring up the topic of sugar. Are there sugars that you're okay with? So you mentioned, Honey, how is coconut nectar on the list for you? Where does that rank uh, raw organic coconut nectar, for example, as a replacement for co conventional sugar? Like coconut palm sugar? The or coconut one? nectar. It's the, it's the, it's the, the, the syrup that comes from the blossom yeah. of the coconut flower that oh, okay. you can buy I now. I don't use Whole that. Do you use it, Aisha? No. So, um, you know, sugar is sugar um, mm -hmm. and it has many different names. But if it's, uh, you know, if it's coconut sugar, if it's palm sugar, if it's Tasmanian sugar, sugar is sugar, unfortunately. I've lost friends based on this sentence. But, <laughs> you know, honestly, um, the, the, the most important thing is eating foods or eating sweeteners that don't really create a spike in your glucose levels and don't you know put your body into a frenzy so that it starts insulin secretion and almost all of the sugar sources even if they're called natural uh, they actually do that honey does that agave syrup does that maple mm. do maple syrup does that to a certain extent not as much it's slower the the incline in uh, in glucose levels so i guess you know if we really want to stay away from sugar one word that I absolutely hate is moderation. What does that even mean? Moderation for someone who is eating five chocolate bars is, you know, not eating four chocolate bars a day versus someone who eats only one. So, you know, getting rid of all of them is ideal. I know it's difficult, but understanding that all of them act essentially the same way. Um, the, the kind of sugars that are good for us are the ones that are bound with fiber. Annie was saying fiber is so important and she's absolutely right. Fiber yeah. essentially keeps the sugar in our gut and doesn't allow it to be released quickly. It's that quick release of sugar from our gut that causes most problems. So fruits, for example, are amazing. They're bound with, fr uh, with fiber and the sugars come with so many other micronutrients and vitamins too. Dates are great too because it has a ton of fiber. Um, and the other artificial sweeteners, one of one someone actually asked about artificial sweeteners, you know, uh, things like monk fruit sweetener is actually really good, you know, pound for pound, it has the same kind of sweetness, you can use it in dessert, you can use it in your, um, in your beverages. I personally don't like stevia, because it's the bitter aftertaste, but it can be good for some people too. <laughs> and there's some other sugar alcohols like erythritol, xylitol. Um, they're, they're great. Some people have some gut issues with them, it causes bloating and GI disturbances. But all in all, <laughs> Those sugars, the monk fruit and the alcohol sugars, they don't release uh, sugar into your into your body, and your body doesn't go into that state of shock. So that <coughs> of it. So those are great. 
Yeah, and one thing that's Dr. really- Dr. Shazai, I'm glad you mentioned uh, some of the alternatives. I'm sorry, Dr. Penning. Just a second, I've had uh, tremendous success personally with clients using monk fruit, monk fruit juice, uh, and uh, stevia. And although stevia does have a little bit of a, of a strong sting uh, in the aftertaste, those are these are both natural sweeteners that come from a natural source. They are not imitation uh, sweeteners. They're not chemically produced in a lab. They both come from plants. Uh, you know, monk fruit is a melon when it starts out in life and, and stevia is an herb when it starts out in life. And you can actually grow the herb stevia and put that in your iced tea yes. if you'd like to. So I'm so glad that we all agree on this topic. I, there's a lot of confusion. And uh, another way I, I found to add fiber to your diet is to use psyllium husk powder. I put it in my shake every day. I try to consume about 40 to 50 grams of fiber a day, both in my fruits and vegetables and, and whole foods and as a supplement. How do you guys feel about supplementing with something like psyllium husk powder to make sure that you're ingesting enough fiber? Any? You know, I try to get fiber through um, the beans and the vegetables and the berries and all the other things in my diet, but I'm sure I fall short a lot of the time. So um, I like to use psyllium, not so much as a supplement, but I use, like to use it in my baking. Um, like I use flax seeds that are ground up because yes. if you're using gluten-free yes, it's flour, a wonderful ingredient. Yeah. Like I like to bake with a lot yes. of nutrient dense flours, like almond flour and hazelnut flour, um, buckwheat flour. And sometimes these gluten-free flours require a little bit more um, structure. So yeah. I like to use it that way. So, so Dr. Fenn, safe to say you also avoid gluten, both for your dietary preferences and probably for brain health. Can, can we talk no, no, I don't a little avoid bit about that? For brain health. I, um, I think that it's perfectly fine okay. to consume gluten as long as you're not gluten sensitive, mm -hmm. gluten allergic, or have celiac disease, which is really less than three or 4% of the population. Yeah. Um, there's lots of very nutrient dense gluten foods, like, um, like some of the wheat products are actually quite good for you. Yeah. Um, but I do like to mess around with a lot of the gluten-free flowers Example, because it can be that... more nutrient dense. And it also improves it also increases the diversity of basically the plant foods in your diet. If you're not always reaching for wheat. Dr. Shazai, we're getting lots of questions. I'm just going to hit you with a few. Should we focus on buying organic foods? I think yeah. you know how I feel about that, but uh, please, please feel free to respond. Absolutely. I mean, um, I, I work, I work with uh, communities who are not, um, who don't have some resources, who may not be, you know, at a socioeconomic state where they can afford to get uh, organic foods. And I work in places where there are a lot of food deserts and with individuals who can't really, you know, have uh, have that at all. So, you know, as far as organic foods are concerned, of course, they're better uh, than conventional foods. Um, there is some research that is continuously being done and we're understanding more and more the impact of chemicals and pesticides on brain health. But at the end of the day, if people eat vegetables, that's more important than eating organic or not eating organic. So what I say is just eat vegetables. If you can afford organic, that's great. But if you can't, even conventional vegetables are important to consume. All you have to do is spend probably a little more time to wash them very well. And washing, washing them, them yes. uh, soaking them can actually get rid of a lot of the pesticides. And it's an area that we're uh, actually learning more and more about the type of pesticides and how it affects brain health. Dr. Fenn, here's a question from Sharon. What about the science that shows the benefit of a keto diet on brain health? Well, you know, there's some things about the keto diet that are really interesting for brain health. Like there's a lot of study on fasting, whether you do it intermittently or part of your religion and how that might change the way your brain ages, um, might help you reach an optimal weight. So I like the fasting component in some ways if it's, if it's done very carefully. Um, what I don't like about the keto diet, the way most people follow it, is that it includes a lot of foods that are very high in saturated fat. Mm -hmm. And we know that the brain healthy diet is low in saturated fat. We have studies that show this, that you wanna keep your saturated fat under 5% of total in your diet. You wanna eat mostly monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats, like the omega-3 fatty acids. So and my problem with keto is mostly it's, it's too restricting. It also eliminates a lot of the food groups that I really want people to eat like whole grains and legumes and things like that. I'm not saying go eat a bunch of refined carbs because we don't want you to do that either, but um, I want people to have a wide diversity of food 
um, because of that whole gut microbiome link with the brain. So if people can do keto quite smart. I've seen that, but I'm concerned about the way I see, I see a lot of people do it. And we don't have studies, do we, Aisha, that shows it prevents Alzheimer's. I was actually going to add to that because it's important for, for, the, for these lovely people who have joined us and are spending time to understand that we don't have good objective evidence that ketogenic diet can actually slow down cognitive decline. The studies that are coming to us, they're very small and they've been done for a very short period of time. And you can't really apply that into the population. They were poor quality. People weren't able to maintain, um, you know, ketosis for a long uh, time. And it was done in people who had advanced Alzheimer's disease. So you can't really apply that into the general population of healthy individuals. And like Annie was saying, it's important to eat a wholesome, unprocessed diet with lots of fiber and ketogenic diet probably might be good short term for losing weight, but long term, it damages the arteries in our brain, which are so important for getting oxygen and nutrition for the very, very sensitive and important parts of our brain that are responsible for memory, for judgment, for decision making, and just living a long life. So it's not consistent with it. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the fats that you would recommend people use in a uh, plant based diet? Um, olive oil is, is an obvious one. Are there others that you guys like that you uh, recommend to your clients? Yeah, I also like avocado oil. I use olive oil as my primary cooking oil based on the Mediterranean yeah. diet studies, based on the MIND diet study and the one that's coming out soon. Um, olive oil is full of monounsaturated fatty acids. Um, it's very low in saturated fat, but it also has polyphenols. And polyphenols are the active ingredients in plants that actually block oxidative stress in the brain. And we're starting to see some studies on people who actually have very, very early cognitive decline and how do their brains react to being supplemented with olive oil in their diet. So yeah. it's very interesting. Um, I got rid of, when I talked to my students in the cooking school about cleaning out their pantries, the first thing we actually do is clean out the cupboard where you keep your oils. We get rid of all of the, the seed oils, all the highly processed oils, all the heat processed oils. So replacing that with extra virgin olive oil plus avocado oil. And another oil I like a lot is pecan oil because it is high in monounsaturated fats and also, also has polyphenols. How do you feel about grapeseed oil? I don't use grapeseed oil a lot. Not natural organic grapeseed oil. Yeah, yeah I, it has a high smoke point. So I use avocado oil instead. You can have to cook with olive oil olive oil fairly gently, but avocado oil has a higher smoke point. So that's replaced all the grapeseed oil in my pantry. And grapeseed's pretty high in omega-6 fatty acids, the more inflammatory ones. So I don't use it at all. Got it. Uh, there's, a, there's a question from Melinda Cooper. No time to cook any good, quote, pre-made meals. I buy a lot of Amy's brand. Dr. Shazai, perhaps you have some thoughts? I would say, um, I, well, there are some really good ones out there, but I think it would be better. I know this is like a little too much pressure on you, but I think it's better to learn a couple of really quick recipes that you can make at home. One of the pillars of brain health uh, that we mentioned in our book, The 30 Day Alzheimer's Solution was eat home cooked meals. And it's not difficult at all, especially if you pre plan and prep, you know, have a pot of chickpeas or have a pot of quinoa that keeps really well in your refrigerator for a long time, have some greens, make two uh, or maybe one dressing, and you can have, you know, a minute and five, a meal in five minutes. So um, do that. I wouldn't really I, I don't I don't have the time or I actually don't know much about brands that are actually good and are uh, well prepared. But, you know, if you have no time whatsoever, a can of chickpeas with some greens and a little bit of lemon and extra virgin olive oil is the way to go. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. I was just going to say a handful of berries is always a great solution for uh, uh, a quick snack, even Absolutely. even part of a meal. Start Absolutely. your meal with a handful of berries. And uh, if you have a if you have a farmer's market nearby, which which uh, happens to, to be the case for many, many more people now than 10, 15 years ago, even in big cities, even in cities with the food deserts, there are farmer's markets, uh, you know, accessible through public transportation. So even in the worst case scenario, you can get to those. You know, you're, you're talking about something that's grown locally, pesticide free, and that's the best of all worlds. When something's grown locally, you know, the nutrition density is much higher. It's not traveled thousands of miles to get to you. It's not as old. And so all the nutritional uh, ingredients, you know, all the nutrition that you're looking for and benefit from 
are still in the food. Sometimes when you buy food that comes from a long way away, like, like a country, another country that's 5,000 miles away, you're, uh, you know, you're eating these foods and making the effort, but you're doing it in vain. I'm not saying eat a chocolate bar instead, but uh, try to get something local if you can. Uh, I just noticed that in New York, there are about 10 new farmers markets uh, all through the five boroughs. So if you're in, uh, on the East Coast, there's good news for you. Of course, if you're on the West Coast uh, in California, there's farmers markets everywhere. Uh, there's a question from uh, Azramad. We try to have salmon two to three times a week. I, I hear you. We love salmon. We try sockeye, which is uh, often wild and uh, doesn't taste as good. Recipes for salmon, I guess, is what he's after, doctors. What, what, uh, what do you have in mind? Well, I can probably speak to that. Um, you know, I would, I would prefer for people to seek out wild salmon if they can. It's more mm -hmm. sustainably harvested and also has healthier fat profile than the farm salmon. If you go to a restaurant, I'd be willing to bet it's gonna be a farm salmon unless it says on the menu that it's not because wild salmon is a little bit more expensive. You don't need to eat salmon every day or fish every day. You can get all the DHA your brain needs with one serving of high quality fish or seafood a day. I mean, per week, one, one serving per week. So you don't need to go crazy, you know, eating salmon every other night. It gets expensive. Um, and it's also, these fish are very precious. So I would choose wild salmon. I would seek out um, a source where you know it's reliable, where you know it's actually not farmed. And I like to cook it very low heat. That means either on the grill with indirect heat, never over direct heat, or in the oven. I literally put my oven at 300 degrees and I put the salmon in there for 20 to 30 minutes. Because um, what, if you cook too much, the vitamin D in the salmon seeps out, and mm -hmm. so do those brain-healthy omega-3 fatty acids. So you want to cook it in a way to preserve those really good brain-healthy fats. Hi, Rocco. Hey. We're going to have to wrap up shortly. Okay. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Uh, I, there's some questions about forever. coconut oil. I'm a big fan. And uh, smoked salmon. Uh, Dr. Fenn, do you, do you think smoked salmon is uh, an okay substitute? I think it's fine. The, the smoking smoking techniques differ. I prefer a cold smoked method if you can seek yes. it out and it should be wild caught salmon. It will say on the package. You have to look for that. Um, the high heat smoke method sometimes can have some inflammatory particles in the food that you don't want to eat all the time. Every once in a while, of course, is OK. And Dr. Shrasai, how do you feel about coconut oil, raw, organic, of course, not the processed stuff? I'm sorry to say, but coconut oil is, it has a lot of saturated fats, as much saturated fat as, you know, beef tallow and butter. Um, and unfortunately, as delicious as it is, I love coconut oil, but it's not very healthy for our arteries. And I wanted to answer Janet's question too. She's a vegetarian and she says salmon is not an option. So Janet, you know, a diet can be healthy with or without fish. As a matter of fact, you know, we have uh, the the book right there, the 30 day Alzheimer's solution. And you know, all of my recipes are, are plant based. So you can actually eat a very healthful plant based, whole food plant based diet, and also which also, you know, benefits the brain. And we have a lot of data for it supporting that concept. Thank you. And Janet, I wrote a book called Rocco's Healthy and Delicious 200 plant based recipes that I think will also fall squarely in the uh, parameters that Dr. Shazai is talking about. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all of your questions. There's another three dozen. I, I wish we had the time to get to them. We're all, uh, we're, we're all looking forward to seeing the, uh, what's going on in the breakout room. So please join us there. Thank you, Dr. Fenn, Dr. Shazai, and of course, uh, HFC and the Women's Alzheimer's Movement uh, for having all of us. We hope to talk to you again soon and uh, see you in the breakout room. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you for Good joining. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rocco. Annie, see you later. Everybody.